Okay, we are live, Myth Visionaries. Welcome back to Myth Vision. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. I was hogtied by Neil, Jacob Berman, and James Valiant just the other day. I finally freed myself, and now I'm back hosting the channel so we can actually get into trouble here today, diving again into some scholarship. I hope you are well. I am in the process of moving, relocating from the East Coast of the United States of America to Washington State on the West Coast. And so I've been working. I broke away just long enough to do this interview in my garage. And so I hope you stay tuned. Let's get the party started. Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Special treat today. As you see, the thumbnail is kind of intense. Uh, the wording is, is very intense. The Rape of Eve. And this scholar that I'm interviewing today is Celine Lilly. How are you, Dr. Lilly? I'm great, Derek. Thanks so much for having me today. Thank you. I want everybody to know real quick, I am reading off of a script. This is a live. Super chat your questions. Dr. Celine Lilly is a scholar of New Testament and early Jesus movement who holds a PhD and MDiv from Union Theological Seminary in New York City and a BA in contemplative psychology from Naropa University. She considers herself multivocational, ad adjuncting, and advising at several undergraduate graduate institution and graduate institutions, lecturing and preaching nationally and serving as the direct is it the direct? Yeah, the direct of adult education and spiritual formation at First Un United Methodist Church in Boulder. Dr. Lilly works at the intersections of ancient language and context and contemporary g questions of gender, trauma, justice, and community to ask meaningful questions of early Christian text. What can the life and death of Jesus tell us about how to live our lives? What does it mean to be vulnerable in a violent world? How do we act? What does it mean to be in community? How can we live lives in the service of all that brings life rather than that which deals death? Among several articles and co-authored books, she has authored The Rape of Eve. We're going to be discussing today. The Transformation of Roman Ideology in the Early or in the Three Early Christian Retellings of Genesis, which engages responses of the early Jesus movement to Roman conquest and sexual violence. First, I must say welcome to the channel before I even read the description of this book, but uh, I hope you're doing well. Thanks, Derek. I should maybe just let folks know too, I'm no longer at First United Methodist Church. Um, I left during the pandemic as many people uh, switched things around and I'm now working for the Western Institute, um, which is for those of you who might know this is the home of the Jesus Seminar and am the Dean of their forthcoming uh, uh, online academy. Nice. Okay, this is good. This is good news. Um, I think your book, while I must say up front, in all honesty, I usually interview scholars, I've read their works, or at least been acquainted with most of what they've written. I'm interviewing you kind of in the dark, meaning I haven't read your work. And the reason is this crazy hectic life I'm living right now trying to paint my house and move. However, the description of your book is a must read. And so let me do that real quick. I uh, learned how to zoom in a little thanks to your friend Gnostic informant who taught me how to zoom in on web pages so everybody could see. The Rape of Eve, the transformation of Roman ideology in three early Christian retellings of Genesis. Now check this out. Sex, violence, power, and redemption. 
in recent decades, scholars of New Testament and early Christian traditions have given new attention to the relationships between gender and imperial power in the Roman world. In this surprising work, Celine Lilly examines core passages from three Gnostic texts from Nag Hammadi on the origin of the world, the reality of the rulers, and the secret revelation of John, in which Eve is portrayed as having been humiliated by the cosmic powers, yet experiencing restoration. Lily compares that pattern with Gnostic savior motifs concerning Jesus and Seth, then sets it in the broader context. This is what I love, what I'm reading here. In the broader context of the Roman cosmogonic, or cosmo, is it cosmogonic? Cosmogonic. Cosmogonic, yeah. Myths at play in the imperial ideology. The Nag Hammadi text, she argues, offer us a window into symbolic forms of Christian resistance to imperial ideology. This groundbreaking study highlights the importance of the Nag Hammadi writings for our fully fuller appreciation of the currents of Christian response to the Roman Empire and the culture of rape pervasive within it. Get you a copy of the book, especially if you're satisfied with what we discussed today and you want to know more. I'm interested, and I must say why up front, why I'm interested is I read Elaine Pagel's work on the origins of Satan. I was once someone who thought there wasn't a historical Jesus. I must admit it, it, it isn't something that is engaged in consensus scholarship. Um, however, a lot of people think that the archons of the age, the 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 daemons that are attacking Paul or that are fighting or trying to keep the truth away or whatnot that are engaging are purely spiritual demonic powers. They never see the humanity aspect. There's like two sides to one coin. Elaine Pagels painted a picture for me where she said it is human and what we would call spiritual. So it's not uh, only demonic forces in another realm. No. Those forces control, in a sense, Rome or the Jews that are rejecting Christ or whatever it is. So there's a two, a double-edged sword here. And your work seems to imply, while the Gnostic text will go into outer space and do the crazy stuff, there is a downright historical reality underlying the mythological here that we're going to be paying attention to. Am I right on that? or? Absolutely. I think you totally nailed kind of what I've been working on with these texts. And... I guess maybe the thing that I'd say is that because particularly something like Nag Hammadi, um, we didn't, you know, we didn't have these texts until 1945. We'd only heard about them from early church fathers. And I think partially because of this, they were overly spiritualized. Mm -hmm. And so folks really weren't looking at what might possible social context be for like, why, why would someone make up these stories? Why? And um, what are the reasons that they might have, uh, emerged. And um, as I started kind of peeling back layers and asking these questions, um, at least to me, it seemed really, really clear that uh, that these texts were, were dealing with things that were going on in their world. Um, the second thing that I might say is, and I'm sure um, most of your audience, uh, this is probably par for the course for them. But, you know, in the ancient world, there wasn't this separation between um, religion and politics. Um, there were, you know, if we think about, I always joke with my undergrads, um, this word that we have for um, spirit, pneuma, um, means breath, wind, and spirit. And I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, like when we would go, um, you know, we'd drive past a cemetery and we'd hold our breath because we didn't want to breathe those spirits in. But it's because of the connections in that word, I think, in the ancient world, like um, breath and wind and spirit are the same thing. So you can actually, it has substance, you can breathe these things in. And so these separations that we make in the contemporary world just didn't exist in any way in the ancient world. So this is kind of one piece of this. And then the second really comes from um, from Jewish um, angelology and mythological ideas where you have these angels um, for each nation in um, in the world. And so what happens in the heavens with the angels is what's happening on earth. Um, for example, um, in, um, in these three te texts that kind of retell Genesis, Yaldaboeth, who often gets yoked with Yahweh from um, from the Hebrew scriptures, his other name is actually Samael. And in several texts, this is the angel of Rome. And so there is there are very direct connections to the political landscape in the ancient world um, in these texts, if we know what we're looking for. 
Ooh. I'm actually going to pull these out a second. Oh, no, that's you're fine. Yeah. You're fine. This is a wonderful, great response, by the way. I really do appreciate it. I want everybody to please go get you a copy because I'm going to be reading this. And when I get to Washington, uh, we are going to have to get the spackle out or whatever you want to call it, the shovel. And let's dig into this deeper and to get into examples far more than I think we're probably going to be able to do in today's episode. Um, I will take questions if people want to super chat them. They help me keep the lights on here and doing what I'm doing, which is also another way of doing it is joining the Patreon. I've also launched a ton of new material. This one was with Andrew Henry from Religion for Breakfast. We deal with um, Jesus the Magician. We actually deal with Morton Smith, what he got right, what he got wrong. And we would dive deep into that. We want to ask the questions. Was Jesus this miracle worker? Probably could have been, uh, but magician is a derogatory term so we have to talk about in group out group concepts mark of the beast with dr john dominic crossing we dive into revelation what is this guy about all of that fun stuff please support us go um i really appreciate the community that helps keep myth vision doing what we're doing here also you have a website the westarinstitute.org i want everybody i added it to the youtube uh description if you want to find out more of what she's involved in you can go to this website did you want to comment about the website briefly or? I, I, I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, there's lots of public programming available. Um, so just, you know, if you're interested in um, historical Christianity stuff, if you're interested in political theology, um, go check this out. And hopefully I might have frozen. You're good. I see you oh, moving. Good, 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 good. I'm just frozen on my screen. <laughs> Well, as long as I'll, I'll tell you if I say, hey, you're there. Uh, what's going on? Uh, but you, posted, Derek. you're coming fine on our end, I think. Make sure everybody let us know in the chat if she's coming through clear. Um, Dr. Lily, what is this book? I mean, you you really wanted to get attention with this title, it seems, right? Like, I mean, we want people to pay attention. And what better way than to say The Rape of Eve? You know, it there is something that's sensationalist about it and i always do let people you know what she did drop i think she was ahead of the i think she was ahead of us on knowing this so okay waiting for her to come back how is everybody in the chat someone said is this is that a feminist lecture coming um, gender studies doesn't require feminist, non-feminist doesn't matter. It wouldn't matter if it is, but nonetheless, we're dealing with the issue that was going on in history pertaining to women, I suspect. And, uh, we're going to get into that. So Jesus wizard spatula, welcome brute facts, Eddie, you know, I like you just that much more than pasta Mike. Uh, good to see you here, my friend. S duck. Hey, thank you for your work. Jason, Lord of the so Sobek, sorry, Lord of the Four Corners. Oh, this is a premiere? Not a premiere, my friend. It is a live. And you're just like, fantastic. I think so, too. I'm glad to be here hanging out in the garage one more time. I think I got a few more of these in before we move. Mind's Eye, S-Duck, what is up? How are you? Rayon, Coltastic. Oh, she's back. <laughs> Hallelujah. I back. <laughs> so sorry about that. My You're computer fine. just totally shut off on me. Um, do you want me to just pick up where pick no, up where please, I left off? There? Please, please, <laughs> yes. Um, so, um, so just so that folks know, I always do like to let folks know. You know, there's a lot of sexual violence here. So, um, just for for your viewers to be aware of this. But you know, what's really interesting is that in these three retellings, Eve is actually raped by the rulers of the world. And this is a very prominent feature in these texts. And initially, um, one of the things that struck me is that, and I totally am um, so grateful for the first generations of scholars who were doing work on um, these texts. Their work makes my work possible. But when they were looking at them, they tended to um, interpret Eve in these texts in much the same way as she gets interpreted in later Christian tradition. Um, and, you know, talk, she's the one who brings sexual sin into the world. She's the one who, um, she's the one who kind of brings the fall, um, uh, brings about the fall of humanity. And these texts really are doing something very, very different. And when I started to notice the differences um, that um, 
the way in which um, Eve is really the savior in these texts, um, the way in which um, like so much contemporary theory around rape, um, these male rulers want um, think that they can gain power um, through their sexual violation of her. And um, again and again, she kind of thwarts them. And uh, in in a kind of a reversal of what we see in the in the story of the garden, the serpent is actually good here. Um, Eve, um, because she's a spiritual power, she knows that she's going to be um, that she's going to be violated in advance, and her spirit actually goes into the tree of knowledge. And the serpent comes along and is again um, this creature from the divine realm. And um, she trusts the serpent, and she eats the fruit from the tree. So what gets split off gets reintegrated. She gives this to Adam as well, and their eyes are opened, and they end up birthing to together the saviors of humanity who basically help um, help humanity overcome these rulers. And um, so this, this piece of sexual violation is actually a really, really integral part to this text. And using some of the work of another New Testament scholar, Davina Lopez, who really has um, taken what people in classics have done around looking at um, rape, both in mythology. So, you know, thinking about Zeus. Zeus and or Jupiter and the multiple rapes that occur with um, Zeus or Jupiter. I'm um, thinking about Apollo and Daphne. Um, I worked on in this book the story that we get from Ovid's Metamorphosis, and then thinking about these uh, founding myths of Rome, um, the rape of Rhea Silvia, um, who births the two founders of Rome, and we could talk more about these as if if you're in, if you're interested. Um, the rape of the Sabine women, which is how uh, Rome starts out with only being a colony of only men, and um, their neighbors think that they're riffraff, and so they won't give them their their uh, daughters to intermarry, and so they basically come up with this plot in order to steal these women. Um, and so this is how Rome gets women through this rape narrative. Um, the Republic actually begins uh, as a result of another rape, the rape of Lucretia. And then um, when the December kind of intervenes and the res restoration of the Republic, there's actually another rape narrative that happens there. And Rome's entire history of conquest, if you look at their visual program, has these um, has these visual materials that depict kind of the rape of the nations. How does Rome get control of them? The, um, the emperors rape the nations. And so I started asking a different set of questions, like, is there something else that could be going on in these texts? And the more I look at them and the more that I read them, they really seem to be this savvy way to use a wide range of mythology from Greek and Roman myth to Roman founding myth to Christian myth to make new kinds of meaning about what might be possible in the midst of this violent culture. Wow. There's so much that came up there that you said, and there, like we would never be able to exhaust this on a single or multiple episodes. I, I do want to mention, you really raised an interesting point. When I went and visited Elaine Pagels, I, Dr. Pagels, I'm, I'm bringing her up again. She's wonderful, amazing human being. And while I sat at her feet in her home that she raised her kids in and everything, I feel pretty honored to even mention that, just to sit in there and hang out with her. And she was describing Revelation. And she said, this is what I think is going on. She thinks it's written around the time of Domitian. Don't put any concrete necessarily, but she, she's pretty convinced. And here is this guy, John, right near Ephesus. Okay, He gets cast out onto the island of Patmos. But in Ephesus, there are these big chiseled out stone monuments with Rome symbolizing a man and every nation has a woman and there's like one of them, he's stepping on her head. Another one, there's a knife to the next one's throat. It's not just rape. It's like almost murderous, yeah. like conquering these people. Is there something connected with that whole motif that you would suggest when there's like 30 nations listed, including Israel or Judah, however you yeah, want to put yeah, it. Yeah as conquered as females that are conquered. And that plays into this ginger power role, which I think is in the picture here. Yeah, so um, so what Dr. Pagels is talking about is this, um, this site that we have in Aphrodisius, Turkey, that's not too far from Ephesus, where Rome figures, um, basically you get this map of the world. So they have these like several different tiers there and, um, some of the tiers actually do have myths. One of them is um, Leto and the, and the swan. So Zeus turning into a swan and raping Leto. So you get this, you get other um, depictions of the emperors, and then you get this map of the world. And basically Rome takes up, um, because the word for um, 
nation in Greek is is gendered female, nations get embodied kind of as these as these women. And in it seems that in Greece, um, these depictions were a lot more benign. But as Rome starts to conquer, starts to come to power, conquer more nations, um, they really start figuring, um, uh, start depicting these nations not only kind of in this more benign fashion where you get um, a woman in their local garb. I always kind of joke it would be like, you know, the Statue of Liberty standing for the United States, or um, part of my own genealogical history is. Um, Dutch. And so like thinking about, you know, the little Dutch girl with her germ with her little wooden shoes and um her little white cap. And that would be, you know, the depiction of of um the Netherlands. So we so this is kind of what it looks like in the ancient world. And then we get these again, um, these other depictions of um Claudius and Britannia, for example. So the Emperor Claudius, and he's like pulling back her hair. It looks like he's about to strike her. I mean, they are, their knees are in their back. I mean, it really looks like they're in this, um, it, I mean, it looks like a posture of rape. And these would have been, visit, these type of visual depictions were seen all around the empire. So people who even couldn't read, they visually would be able to, um, to understand kind of what this idea of conquest was. Um, there is another um, ancient text by the historian Tacitus, um, the Agricola, Agricola, um, Agricola was his um, father-in-law and he's the one who kind of finally conquers um, Britain. And he puts this speech in the mouth of one of the, um, one of the local chieftains there, uh, uh, Calgacus, and he basically calls the Romans the rapers of the world. So this motif is um, widespread. We see it in visual depictions. We see it in written depictions as well. Uh, so this would have been something that everyone knew. That was part and parcel. And you know, this is the other thing. Just to say, with you know, something like crucifixion too. Crucifixion is a feminizing, um, and you know, we always want to be careful with gender and realize that it's constructed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's actually a feminizing punishment because of the penetration and the degradation that goes alongside of it. Wow. So, so yeah. So if we think about things like <laughs> crucifixion, the penetrations of the nation. So Rome is impenetrable. Um, and this is why you then have the Vestal Virgins there who um, they, they can't commit a, adultery. Every time that Rome feels a threat from the outside, they actually accuse a Vestal Virgin of adultery. And she's either buried alive or thrown off this rock and killed to try and, um, you know, it's like this homeopathic remedy almost that, you know, oh, if we if we do this thing, then then we will be able to stay whole and impenetrable. So only the nations who are feminized can be penetrated. And we who are Rome are the impenetrable ones. I wonder what the death penalty for a Roman who commits some type of thing, uh, treason or whatever, they're beheaded or it, it probably isn't crucified, huh? Not be they're they're beheaded. Um, crucifixion was only for um, primarily only for um those who were enslaved, um, those uh, insurrectionists, um, and you know, for for those who were kind of under Rome's purview. You made me want to go back and reread the Apocalypse of John because in chapter two, when he is writing to the seven churches, yeah, he's rebuking one of the churches, which I found maybe Elaine Pagels to be onto something about this idea of being against Paul's ideas. Uh, because it talks about eating meat sacrificed to idols. And who said, go ahead and eat meat sacrificed yeah. to idols? Paul. But then it says, and committing adultery. Like mm -hmm. like f following up like a sexual act. And what made me think is, this author keeps calling Rome the horror of Babylon. Yeah. They're reversing the, they're having to hide it in code, but they're reversing mm -hmm. the orientation to try and call the impenetrable a female yeah. that's a, yeah, what in the world? I, I wonder if this all plays into what you're describing. Yeah. So this, you know, Derek, what you're actually bringing up is something that I have not spent a lot of time thinking about, but I actually think it's really fascinating to think about this very specific reversal. Um, I too think, uh, think Elaine Pagels is onto something with, um, with, with her Revelations book as well. Um, but this, this piece around the fact that the impenetrable one becomes a whore and um, obviously, you know, doing, um, 
doing uh, feminist biblical scholarship, like all of these images are really problematic in a lot of ways. But at the same time, we also need to think about the ways in which the folks then are using the resources that are at their disposal. And that I, that I do think that these are um, really connected concepts. Like, yes, what does it mean to call the impenetrable one um, a whore who's, um, you know, uh, sleeping with every nation that she can get her hands on and which is kind of what 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 they're implying with this and i do think this is part of this same um ideological this larger ideological um construct where women lose on both sides yeah th yeah th they're an instrument or a tool used yeah. in this uh, ideological battle which which makes me think of that the 144,000 virgins yeah. that have never defiled themselves with a woman and you know there's right. still this misogynistic patriarchal thing here but mm -hmm. but i don't think he necessarily the author is intending that to be literal i wonder if it's yeah. this like what yeah. john dominic cross has been saying to me is he's like the, the author's trying to say don't even do business with these people buy or sell you know the mark on, and it makes me go what the heck is going on anyway I yeah, might I mean, derailed you a little bit. No, well, I was going to say, you know, this is this piece around absolute non-accommodation that Dom is getting at with this. And um and and I do think, you know, if if we look at these, you know, these three texts from Nagamati even, it is really hard for them to imagine um a world beyond this. I mean, they most of these texts also end in the utter destruction of the world like they think we need to start from scratch again so um there is this way in which this um you know this this big like what what does life look like if you're not a com if you if you aren't accommodating to rome at all and mostly i think it looks like it in terms of these texts that you're going to get killed and so the hope is that um some deity is going to sweep in and wipe everything away which is what we get at the end of you know whether it's um the revelation um of john in the New Testament, in the canonical New Testament, or you know something like on the origin of the world from Nakamati. I'd love. I want to follow you actually, if we can go into this because, you know, you're dealing with Nakamati. I literally brought up <laughs> the Book of Revelation here. Um, take us into these books if you don't mind, and maybe we could deal with one book at a time, or however you want to do this. Describing what you've discovered on that kind of human level, what's going on? You've kind of painted the rape scene that is prevalent. Mm -hmm. Like, if you don't know that, you're going to miss a lot. So please take us into wherever you want to go with this. So I think the the two things that I think are really interesting is that, um, you know, and some of this uh, scholars talk about it being based on Plato and um, Plato's ideals versus what's going on in the material realm. So you get this kind of upper world and lower world, which I do think is playing a part in all of these texts. Um, so they're kind of reading, they're really interested in um, just kind of like Philo in, um, in Alexandria, the Jewish scholar, but of reading, you know, what does it look like to read these texts alongside uh, Greek and Roman philosophy? So I think that's one of the things that that's going on where you have this kind of ideal upper realm and the heaven, heavens, and then you have what's going on, on on the earth. But we also get these two narratives of creation that go on in, um, in Genesis, in the Hebrew scriptures. And um, basically, there are two names for God that end up happening in, um, in, in these two stories. So we get the first one where um, the human beings are created in the image of God, male and female, um, they create them. And then we get the story of Adam and Eve in the second story. So I think that these also correspond to these two levels that are going on in um, in the Nag Hammadi text is that you get this perfect divine realm, which is kind of what's happening with the first Adam or sometimes Seth people talk about kind of happening that's in, in conjunction with this first creation narrative. And then you get the second creation narrative, which is about Adam and Eve. The other really interesting thing to me um, that I kind of discovered, and I think this is something that needs a lot more research. I was a New Testament person, not a Hebrew Bible person. And so um, this is just, again, one of the places that I think um, really uh, needs a lot of, um, could could use a lot of work around this. Um, but you get in the first um, creation narrative, you get Theos as the name of God in the Greek Septuagint. And um, so Theos corresponds to God. And in the second um, one, um, Yahweh um, 
corresponds to uh, Kurios. So Theos goes with Elohim, Kurios goes with um, with Yahweh. And the interesting thing about this is that Kurios is also, so it's the word that we translate as Lord. And it's also the word that would have been used to talk about the emperor. And in it seems that in um, Alexandrian exegesis of the Hebrew scriptures, that this was also um, the name of God that was associated with the king. So there's all of these really interesting correspondences that link somehow Yahweh with um, with this more human kingly realm and then directly the emperor. And so I think then these texts become this allegory for these um lower gods who think that they're the real god but they're actually not um they're really beastly they're violent they um they they rape they rape people they want people to be their subjects and um and so i do so i think that again kind of going back to wh where you started with this idea that what happens above is what's happening below, that this is then a way to kind of allegorize, make sense, um, mythologize um, these very real dynamics that are happening um, in um, in the everyday lives of the people um, kind of um, dreaming these up. Uh, and just to say too, you know, so often myth, we think about, you know, these pre primordial things that then shape how we view um, how we view the world. But so often myth is actually rewritten to reflect the world we live in today, that it's not actually about the past, but it's about creating ideologies now. And so I think that there's that if we start to look at myth in this way, that it becomes um, it becomes this window um, into possibilities of thinking about what the social context for um, for where these um, about you know the social context of where these where these texts came from. I love the this whole discussion. Uh, I can't wait to read your book. As far as the idea of the, these people who think they're gods, and this might be a good explanation where what we call Gnostics get their ideas if they're engaging with the Roman Imperial cult, because every Caesar, I mean, some of them are really blatantly yeah. were obnoxiously deified. Uh, I think uh, Hadrian was big on this whole yeah. thing. I mean, he was one of the big ones in the early second century, but we know like Caesar Augustus and others with these titles, you know, the book of Luke and Acts literally takes the titles from these emperors and gives them to Christ. So you wonder if Paul has this kind of above below thing going on in his thinking as well. Um, I, I just wondered, there's so many things that you said there that I don't know if we're going to be able to even dive into. And, and I, a lot of it already passed through my brain, but I love your idea about myth because I think we need to write our own myths. I think we need to not necessarily believe them literally, but believe them as in like, here's something to aspire to. Here are some things to, look at how we can better ourselves as, as people. So I don't know where to go. <laughs> yeah, well, Derek, I was just going to say on that note, you know, one of the things that, that I quite often wonder about, particularly looking at, um, looking at Nag Hammadi, looking at so many of the apocryphal texts that we get from early Christianity, if that one of the things so often we take, you know, what comes from the New Testament as prescriptive, like this is what you're supposed to do. But once you start to break down these boundaries, you notice the diversity that's even happening within our canonical New Testament itself. And one of the questions that I really have is, is what we're supposed to be taking as inspiration from these early Jesus folks is the myriad of ways and the creativity with which they use the Jesus story to address what's actually happening in their communities, happening in their contemporary world, whether that's the first century, the second century, the third century, and making new kinds of meaning in conjunction with um, their wider cultural milieus. And what if that was the thing that we were actually supposed to learn about this, like this possibility of new myth-making, of recasting myths 
for our contemporary, for our contemporary time, much like just to say, you know, people sometimes find this really heretical, but I'm like, you know, isn't this what pastors do every week in their churches is they read a piece of scripture. They see what's going on in their community. They see what's going on in their world. And they tell different stories to bring that piece of scripture to life. And maybe this is the thing that we're supposed to be getting from this. And it is is really about this creativity and the possibility of what this um what this story about this like Galilean peasant who somehow comes to Rome's attention you know these are i think um one of the things that i know that you talk about is like what can we actually know about Jesus and i think there's little that we can know about Jesus for sure um but for me the things are that like obviously like he's doing he's probably from Galilee I would guess most likely that's the case. I would probably stake a little claim on that, that he was doing some kind of teaching, that he had some kind of following, that whatever he was doing came to the attention of Rome and that it seems like he was crucified as king of the Jews, which is a political title. And then something happened to the, like the people had some kind of experience of him, you know, what that was. Um, I, you know, we, as uh, one of my colleagues says, you know, we need a time machine to actually know what was happening. But there's something, um, there's something there about that intersection of the spiritual and the political. And this is what we see, I think, in these texts again and again and again and again. And what would it mean to kind of take that as the, um, as the charge from these, from this variety of texts, rather than saying like, women be silent in the churches, don't eat, I don't mean, um, you know, whichever kind of thing you want to pick from, um, from the Bible. I don't know. I'd even go a step further and just be like, why do we need the creeds? Like, why are we solidifying particular interpretation models on this? Give, let people favor it however they can understand it. I'm sorry, I take that as allegory, or I'm sorry, I take this. Yeah. Feel free, create a community like that. Instead, it's become so dogmatic and stuff. And it makes me wonder, because right there at the gate, here you have docetics, you have you know, Marcy and I, you got all this stuff going on and the unity is a big red flag. Like, why is there so much disunity and, and problems going on? So, yeah. um, yeah. There's, can I, Derek, can yeah, I just say that? Please. Like, I, I just think it's interesting. Like, does disunity need to be problematic? Like what's happened? And I, you know, this is one of my questions too, just about what's going on in the ancient world. And I do wonder sometimes if some of the consolidation that's happening is around this, whether it's actual or perceived threat of violence, that if, if we look more like Rome, if we make our churches, our, our communities look more like the Roman household rather than this, um, this more horizontal um, community structure, which we know had enslaved folks and women and old folks and young folks and, and, you know, all kinds of people who were involved in it. If we actually make this look more like Rome's hierarchical structures and have a more top down, um, top down structure, will this keep us safe? And so just to say, you know, I do wonder like what, what, and, you know, is it just about power? Like what's really the impetus for being so frightened by, um, by the multiplicity that's going on, which really reflects in certain ways, the multiplicity that's going on in the culture at large, where you, where there was no problem in being, um, you know, in worshiping the emperor and going to the ISIS, um, and going to the ISIS, you know, the ISIS mysteries and going to the Demeter and Persephone mysteries, like you could do it all um, in the ancient world. And like, what is it about? Um, yeah, just asking. I Yeah. So just just it's it's just a question that I have that yeah. so often it's like, oh, like this got too messy and da, da 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 da. But what if like what if we just kind of shift that question a little bit and say like, oh, like what what stoked fear? about this messiness like what great work might have the messiness been um doing and then where were um like where were probably the fears involved that made people need to clamp down and put boundaries on this mm. yeah i think you're right there's probably multiple things to it yeah. and not just one and people had to think this out but they were living it so yeah. the answers were probably clear in front of them whereas we can easily judge from our seats 2000 years removed, uh, 1900 years removed and go, ah, oh, why did you do that? Oh, well, maybe we would have done the same thing if we were in their shoes. However, you can wish that things were different. Uh, 
I, I do I, have super get, chats, just so you know, whenever oh, whenever you yeah. want, we'll take questions. I was going to say, we could do that now. And I was just going to say, you know, it's interesting to think, like, given the political climate in the United States right now, like, what will people be saying about this moment in time, you know, in hindsight? There's, you know, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, what side of history are you going to fall on, you know? <laughs> interesting. Okay, Sobek, Lord of the Four Corners. Jason, thank you so much uh, for the super chat. Explain how Noria is a Christ figure a la Eve. Oh, I'm so glad you brought up Noria. Um, she's one of my favorites. Uh, so for people who don't know about her, um, she is Eve's daughter in, re in the reality of the rulers, which is also sometimes called the hypothesis of the archons. And she is, she's basically um, Eve's, uh, virgin um parthenos daughter I, I always want to use that really carefully because it's because it's not just about virginity it's that term in um greek is more complex than that but so she's kind of this um self-contained daughter of eve and she usurps seth in this text and basically she um she tries to get on Noah's boat. So this text continues on with the Genesis story. And um, I always wonder if like what would happen if the um, contemporary story of uh, the contemporary movie of Noah was had Noria in it. But she she wants to get on the boat and um, Noah won't let her on. And so she has this fiery breath and she burns it up. <laughs> and um Basically, these archons, then again, um, the rulers see her power and says, we're going to we, we're going to enslave you like um, like we enslaved your mother, Eve. And she cries out for help. And this angel, Aleleth, intervenes and tells her the story of where the rulers come from. And so then she ends up becoming this spiritual mother of um of the folks that come after to help them get outside of the arc of the ruler's control. So, so oh, I got to I got to so there's so much here to really you know, I watched um Wizard of Oz, okay, when I was younger. I didn't know that there was a political narrative underneath this entire mythological movie that we call the Wizard of Oz, where the Tin Man represents the Iron Worker. They don't really have a heart, or is it a brain? I can't remember. No, the Scarecrow doesn't have a brain. brain. Either way, the point is there's a farmer. They're not smart, yeah. supposedly, so they don't have a brain. And the Tin Man doesn't have a heart. Or, And then you have the Lion, which is the soldier of America who needs courage. You know, there's symbolism that is reflective of the reality of America in a tough time. Have you kind of done your own interpretation of some of these mythologies like this one in particular? What do you think on the ground is happening in this in this little community in the Nag Hammadi literature that they're really enduring so they write this myth to kind of reflect that? What do you think is happening? I mean, I think it's a really interesting question and it's one of the ones that I wish we could know. Um, I wish we could know more about. Um, the the two things that i'd say is that i um obviously there's some i think there's some kind of connection going on between this personal ex um personal experience of sexual violence and um the lar larger ideology around roman conquest um i think with someone like um noria it's um and some folks have kind of said, you know, oh, look, it's another man sweeping in to take care of, you know, to take care of her and the angel of Lilith. But I also think, like, how amazing would it be that someone could actually cry out for help in the ancient world, anyone who was feminized? And just to say, so anybody who's penetrated is feminized. And um, a, a man... Um, a Roman male was always the penetrator, and it didn't matter who or what he was penetrating, as long as he was the penetrator. And anyone pe penetrated is then feminized. Um, male, female, male, gender fluid, like no matter kind of what you want to think about this. And so to think about um, someone being able to cry out for help and they're actually being intervention, 
I just think is this um, must be this amazing imagination on the parts of whoever is there, whether it's thinking about like our nation um, and what might be going on in the communities writing this on this front, um, the violence that they might that they might endure. If we think about, um, I always love thinking about Pliny's letters to Trajan. So he was the governor of um, Bithynia, and he we happen to have this huge correspondence between um, him and the emperor Trajan, and it's one of the first really from the Roman side about. Um, early Christianity. And one of the one of the groups of people that gets um, tortured are these um, these enslaved women. And to think about if penetration is a kind of part and parcel of enslavement in the in the ancient world, um, to think about like, oh my goodness, like the possibilities of who might have been writing about this and concerned about this, considering the diversity of the early um these early Jesus com communities, I just think there's so many possibilities of what they might have been um, pushing up against. And so then it's up to us today to really think about the breadth of the imaginal possibilities of what might have been being um, what might have been being addressed and what communities. Obviously, these are communities that care about this type of intimate violence, that care about what colonization looks like, and that and that really are trying to imagine. Um, in reality of the rulers and actually in all of these um in all of these texts there are these moments that really talk about um the imperial trappings much like um revelation i think it's 18 with where you get the cargo list of all the different cargoes that are coming to rome from around the known world um and and how um wealth and power come into play of leading people astray that that they are trying to get um sorry about this this is a kind of windy answer around this it's okay but um but that um they're they're really seeing the violence that is um that comes with all of these trappings of empire, whether it's greed, power, exploitation, and um, and are really trying to use, and just to say, you know, like, um, again, on the origin of the world, I love this text. I think we just have not done enough work on it, but like the, the um, myth of Eros and Psyche shows up in the middle of it. So you get um, a real amalgam of the mythic resources that are in the, in the culture of the time to try and um, think about where people are and, and what other possibilities are. But I, I just think that there's this broad range of, um, of possibility and we don't again we don't really know where these texts emerge from um you know some folks are saying alexandria other folks are putting them into other you know other other places in the roman empire if we think about you know irenaeus is writing from what's now um contemporary southern france and he knows um the kind of the back these backbones of these stories the scaffolding of these stories um so they're they're all over the empire and so whatever they're addressing is ubiquitous enough that people in egypt are reading them and Irenaeus knows about them from um you know in in leon wow yeah and of course there's supposedly a happy ending in revelation where the wealth and the riches the kings of the earth bring in their wealth and riches to the new jerusalem at the end so they're picturing all of that you know surrendering itself uh or being destroyed of course um there, there's a lot there so yeah we don't know the place we don't know exact details so we can't really correlate oh the lion is actually the soldier but at, you're not you're saying it's not a, a bad guess to say this still probably has to deal with that what we call whore babylon and revelation rome at large yeah. and its imperial power and its imperial Absolutely. cult probably somehow plays a role i wonder if some of these nagamati texts might be trying to uh, go against the other versions of christendom because there's in group out group issues but i don't know if any of these three texts are dealing that you have your book written about if they're dealing with the other groups of christians or not um, I think I think they probably are. You know, they're they're again on the origin of the world, um, and I think it needs to be looked into further. But um, you know, some of the words that are used in this, particularly in talking about Eve's subjugation, are the same words that we find in um, in like First Timothy, where they're talking about the subjugation of women. So I do think there is there is knowledge of. Um, of what's going on in some of these other communities, uh, they are um, 
and some of these texts really like Paul. I mean, they, they I, it's, I think it's the beginning of reality of the rulers that actually quotes Paul and talks about him, you know, kind of as our, as our apostle. So they're using all of these resources too. Um, the Gospel of Mark, Gospel of John, I mean, you name it. Um, texts are being quoted again and again and again. I think about, which I not something that I talked about in this, but um, the Gospel of Truth, um, which is attributed to uh, Valentinus in, um, in Rome, you know, uses, uses Paul all over the place. So there are already at this point too, different ways of interpreting Paul. So just to like, again, look at the, um, they do know about each other and they're really um, using text in different ways, pushing up against one another to, to think about, um, you know, on some level, I don't think it's the only model, but, you know, again, coming back to this question of accommodation, um, in something like Revelation, where you know John, John, John of Potmos is saying no, no accommodation to Rome. Then you get something you know in Corinth, and I think Paul deals with this differently depending on what community um, he's with. But you get you know, eh, you can eat idol meat if you want to, as long as you know that it's not a thing. But don't lead your you know siblings in Christ astray with this. And then you get you know later things like again First Timothy where you where you definitely have like a household of God and um and the Christian community is set up exactly like the patriarchal Roman household with men on top, but women subordinated, children subordinated, enslaved folks subordinated, and it's a very, very clear cut. So, you know, already we're getting these different um these different types of these different types of communities, but it's all kind of on one level about this level of accommodation. How much are we going to accommodate? First Timothy, yes, we are going to accommodate, and there's actually a prayer for the emperor there. You know, yay, emperor! And then we get you know middling things like the end, like the end of Romans, where um, where he's like, you know, don't um, maybe don't piss off the powers. And now scholars think this is because the Judeans who've been exiled from Rome, they're coming back. And it's like, we don't want to get our siblings, our Jewish siblings in trouble when they come back. So like, cool it a little bit. And then we get something like Revelation that's like, no way. And it seems like these three texts are, in my opinion, are a little bit more, you know, like, let's, let's drop out. It's not necessarily, um, again, it's not necessarily armed resistance, armed revolt, but what does it mean to sequester ourselves um, away from this lifestyle and community in different ways? Mm. Mm -mm. So many questions. I, I, let me get to the super chat yeah. because if not, we will never uh, get there. So M Doug, thank you for the super sticker. My friend really appreciate the support. I did not see a response. Just making sure. Hold up. Okay. Nope. You're responding to somebody else. Just showing some support. I really appreciate that. Um, Abel Chavez says perhaps the Torah was the catalyst for humanity to go from matriarchal to patriarchal, but more than this, from the natural order to a more modernized or human order industrialization and inversion, it rewired humans' brain. Thank you for the super chat. Did you want to make, did you, I don't know, did you get anything out of that? I think there's so much juicy stuff here that is probably above my pay grade on some levels. But I do just want to note that, um, you know, one of the things that, that I do, again, have questions about are just the ways in which I think the folks who we call the early church fathers, like, really upped the ante on uh, on the patriarchy, that they, um, that they really, in interpreting the... Um, interpreting a lot of the text from the Hebrew Bible, I think they upped the ante on that. And so... Um, again, not that it's not ac across the board um, in some ways. And I think really it reflects a lot of, of Roman culture at the time too. Um, and then again, there are always these women that like um, that pop up like Deborah, um, who's a judge in the book of Judges or, mm -hmm. um, or Judith or, um, you know, there's like, you know, whether it's the Hebrew, Hebrew Bible or, um, or the Christian, you know, the Christian Testament, you know, we get Mary Magdalene's and, um, and uh, Phoebe, whose who's name is an apostle at the end of Romans. So, you know, there's like, there's, 
it's it's a it's a mixed and complicated um bag but i do think it like the ante gets up on up on all of this as um as things become more codified as we get as you talked about you know creeds christianity becomes mm -hmm. religion of the empire that that all of those things um get consolidated but a really really great um great question and um as i said a lot of it's above my pay grade yeah, Abel, thank you for the super chat. I have a hard time wrapping my head around it as well, completely getting where you're coming from, but I seriously appreciate the support, my friend. Um, Jason Sobeck's back, Lord of the Four Corners. Would love to see you and Davina Lopez in dialogue on Paul and Gnostic's aversion on Gnostic Informant or Myth Vision. Love both your books. Thank you so much. And I love Davina Lopez. She was actually um, a tutor of, she was actually a tutor and mentor of mine in my PhD program. And um, her work was instrumental in me thinking about this. So thanks for giving another shout out to uh, Davina. She, um, Davina's work is just um, amazing. Her book is Apostle to the Conquered. Um, that was kind of a big, um, a big influence on, um, on my work. So yeah. So thanks for that shout out. Thank you so much, Sobek. I really appreciate that super chat. I think we're caught up right now and I'm always what ready to go back. If anyone wants to super chat questions, I had one that you're not a Pauline expert. Um, that doesn't mean you haven't read scholarship about Paul. Uh, you know, I read it all the time and I always go back and forth on this guy we call Paul. Um, it seems like two, like you said, there's two different interpretations of Paul, Valentinian type or that go off into the Gnostic world types. And then you had the more orthodox position. Um, and Paul seems kind of ambiguous at times. We're not sure what the heck to make of him. He seems a, like a mystical Jew. So do you personally have an opinion on who Paul better fits and did did they tame Paul? Do you think Paul was more along the lines of more what we would call Gnostic, but gets tamed and orthodoxed, kind of combining the Jerusalem church and Paul and making some form of Christendom that works like Irenaeus or whatnot, or Justin Martyr, you name it. What do you think Paul's doing? Yeah, I definitely think um, Paul gets a domesticated. <laughs> Um, not only by folks who are, you know, writing what we consider, uh, most scholars consider pseudo-Pauline letters in, um, in the New Testament, um, or if it's, uh, you know, beyond that with, with folks writing later on. Um, I think, you know, we tend to bifurcate, bifurcate Paul and put him, you know, Orthodox heresy, and I think he's much more complicated than this. He, um, you know, I think he's actually really, I think he's pragmatic on a lot of levels that he sees who his communities are. And um, not that he doesn't have an agenda. I'm not always sure what that is, um, but that he really is trying to speak to specific needs in his communities. He's not writing a systematic theology. He's seeing what's happening on the ground and trying to answer people's questions. Um, I think it's, I lament often that we don't have the letters that were written to him or the other side of this conversation. We need to remember, like, we're looking at really complex communities through, you know, one little lens. But one of the things that I, you know, I constantly wonder about Paul, I do think he's really mystical. Like, what does he mean by in Christness, putting on Christ, which we get in, um, in Galatians, um, you know, this, this section of Galatians 3, where he probably inherits the baptismal formula around, you know, in Christ, there is no Jew nor Greek, um, slave nor free, male and female. But that, but that this is really important to him. Um, there's also this other um, lovely line that I love in Second Corinthians that uh, I did a lot of work on the Gospel of Mary in my master's degree. And in, um, in the Gospel of Mary, Mary kind of goes through these different levels of heaven. She these seven powers that we think um, correspond to the seven layers of heaven. Um, you know, just so that folks know, I love this cosmology that you know each of the planets creates a different level. Um, our days of the week, week are named after the seven planets, so you know we get these levels of heaven. And Paul talks about someone who we think it's actually him who gets caught up in the third heaven. So he's doing some kind of mystical heaven journey that he gestures to in in Corinthians that no one ever, you know, no one preaches on that on Sunday morning. Um, so I, you know, I think I think it's again, I think it's complex, just like. 
you know, we're different in different contexts, like when we're with our friends versus, um, you know, for me in a classroom, or if I happen to be preaching on a Sunday morning, or if I'm, you know, with my family, you know, we, we have different facets of our personalities that come out in, in different ways, in different, in different locations because of, because of the context that we find ourselves in. And um, I think that's something that I wish was talked about a lot more in Paul and thinking about, okay, so what are, what are these complexities instead of moving into this bifurcation, like, ortho, like here, orthodox heresy, like, or orthodoxy, not, you know, however, Gnosticism, however people are framing this, that it collapses the complexity, not only of, you know, like what's going on in Paul, what's going on in these myriad letters that some of which he wrote, some of which he didn't, but also the complexities that we find within Gnosticism and what becomes orthodoxy later, these very imperfect terms that end up really um, creating these, um, opposing dualisms that that where where the ground is just so much more complicated oh man <laughs> there's a lot there yeah because I, I guess we get the picture in our head we're, we're so used to hearing orthodoxy argue yeah. for a chain like a chain goes back to peter so if you hear peter you're hearing what the church father's saying and they're one and the same or there's somehow a chain where the gnostic valentinius talks about i got this you know paul paul's our guy you know and so you think you're kind of taking them at their word when in reality, this might just be credential tabs they put on their chest and they've picked up yes. some tradition about Paul, but we don't really know about the guy too much or what he was really about. And I think that's why I get into these studies. Sorry, I derailed you from your work. Um, mm -hmm. What other particular texts would you say you find fascinating in line with your book that you discussed? We, we went into this creation myth, particularly about Eve. Is there some other literature? that we didn't go into yet. Oh my goodness. I mean, you know, I think just to say like one of the coolest things about these texts is the fact is for me is the fact that I think they're picking up on so much other mythology during 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 this time period. So, you know, going back and reading like Livy's Histories of Rome and having like what is it like what does it mean for for this to be read alongside um you know, the straight Genesis to be read alongside it, Libby. Can I ask Genesis, you one yeah. question though? I thought yeah, about absolutely. this earlier when you were talking about degradation or the, or the woman in, in the act of rape and all that in the context here, I thought about Inanna and I know that goes mm -hmm. way, 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 way back. I get it. And I don't want to sound like a fruit loop here who doesn't know what he's talking about, but like the idea of Inanna like literally degrading herself and stripping off her royalty, her majesty, her clothing, and every single piece that came off as part of her dignity to shame herself. And then of course become a corpse and then to come back from that. I wonder, is this just a proto version of what we're finding in the Greco Roman, all of these rape myths that we're finding, or do you think they directly are aware of Inanna? What are your thoughts as an expert? I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if, I mean, people are savvy. They know, they know these myths. And, you know, every time um, Anana comes up and Anana has come up with other folks and asking about like, do you think this is, a, do you think this is a possibility? I also think about um, Demeter and Persephone and, um, and, you know, the, the Eleusian mysteries that were, that were really prevalent, you know, which have very similar, um, similar overtones of this idea of, um, the um it you know it's death and resurrection it's what we get in the jesus story too and looking at the ways in which this keeps playing out and um if it wasn't a physical death rape was certainly considered a social death and so in this text you know in these texts too eve um eve eve is violated in this way but it does not constitute a social death um in fact um her children end up becoming saviors. She's a savior figure. And so it's really, um, Nori is a savior figure. You know, her daughter after the fact is a savior figure. And so it's a really, um, so I do think there are these resonant possibilities um, because it's in the soup of the time. And why, um, again, like, I think it's an area that we can, um, that probably deserves a lot more thought um, careful thought and study, you know, we don't want to kind of collapse these stories necessarily that are really uh, culturally contingent. 
And at the same time, it is part of the soup in the ancient world. And so why wouldn't we think that some of these ideas um, are clearly um, resonant when all of the sudden we are thinking about Eve, who has been denigrated, particularly by the early church. I mean, I think about Tertullian talking, you know, woman is the devil's gateway because of Eve's sin. And there is a reclamation of this figure going on. And um, when you have uplifted figures like Demeter, like Anana, like you, like there, to me, there is a real possibility of Isis. Um, there's a real possibility of thematic resonance there. And why wouldn't there be? Oh, so many things come to mind. I don't know if the Mariology is late coming uh, when, when that becomes prevalent because she becomes very important. Yeah. Uh, one in like to the point where she would fit into some Trinitarian images you would, you would imagine in art. Um, don't know about that. I definitely need to look at Stephen Shoemaker's book on Mary because I hear that's one of the top ones when it comes to her. But with what you're describing here, I wonder if there's any relevance in this with the passage in one of the epistles, or it might be the pastorals, where it talks about women will be saved by their childbearing. Yeah. Is there, well, does this play any role into all of this that you're describing? I mean, this again is First Timothy and First Timothy, <laughs> First Timothy. Um, yeah, that um, women women are to remain silent. They're to be, to be subordinate, and they're going to be sh saved by childbearing because that's because of Eve. And I also I do think that this pushes up against that. Obviously, Eve does bear um, does bear children, but it's really clear that this is in partnership with Adam. That there's something different going on here, and um, and there's a really wide variety of you know if you look at um, there's also a theory that um, I hate to throw another text in here, but the acts of Paul and Thecla, where Thecla is a follower of Paul, she's betrothed to be married, and um, she basically decides that she is going to remain celibate and uh, travel around and preach, preach and teach. It's and heal. It's a really awesome um, story. That's kind of like a, a celibate um, Greek romance novel. <laughs> um, but she, you know, she. She, it, there are scholars that also think that she's happening in dialogue with First Timothy, and here's someone who's celibate that doesn't have kids. So there's really this wide range of images that we get in um, in the literature around this. And but I do think that because Eve doesn't follow, Eve is clearly not subordinate. One of the things that that the texts say that um, the seal of her voice was actually raped be, because of her her saying that these weren't really gods um, is kind of the implication in this. And so she's clearly teaching and preaching and calling out the male powers that be. And so um, whether she has children or not, like seems to be um, more about this legacy and lineage rather than being saved through childbearing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think on all kinds of levels, it's, it's pushing up against um, against a text like First Timothy, the Paul and Thecla scene isn't this where Paul gets killed because he's like the women aren't going and sleeping with their husbands now or something. So yeah, they keep throwing him into the arena um, to, oh, okay. because because it, uh, yes, and and Thecla keeps getting thrown into the arena because um, yes, because Paul is telling people to be celibate and they don't want Thecla to be an example of this. And so, and then there are miraculous, um, miraculous things that come and save her at every turn, um, which are, which are actually very, it's a, it's a really fun story. I must get your book and read this book. Um, I, I'm interested in actually, once I've read it, I'm fairly confident we will have so much to dive into about this. You made me, once again, you added another thing to my thinking of what I did. Elaine did it when I was reading hers, and I went, oh, snap. It doesn't have to be either or. It can be both. There's something going on. And then you just brought that to a whole other level, This just the idea of penetration and what is going on in all these myths. I, I'm not going to say Inanna didn't have possibly something in their thinking, but it might be more likely Inanna – influence some of the contemporaneous mythologies that they are rewriting in their own time 
uh, and here are the examples. So it, you also made me reflect for a moment. I'll get to the super chats in just a second, but you made me reflect for a moment in the way that this is written. It almost sounds like it's written from a female. It almost sounds like there's a woman who's trying to say something and she's like, you know what? You can silence my voice, but it's not going to work. I'm going to win. You know what I mean? Like there's some confidence. Like you wake up in the morning, you look at yourself in the mirror when you tell yourself, I can't do it. But there's one day you finally go, no, you know what? I believe in myself. I can do it and I will do it. And in fact, I have what it takes kind of like a self-help type of, <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know. It, it feels like that, but I don't know. What do you think? Do you think we can kind of determine the gender of the author based on some of the literature? I, you know, I always hate, I hate this question because it, a lot of me wants to say, of course, a woman wrote this. Like the, the experience is so intimate that it really seems like um, this is probably, you know, it, that it, it could highly likely it's written by a woman. Um, that said, like, you know, in my dream world, like this is written by a community of yeah. all kinds of folks. Um, you know, I also love, which I think is really cool. We haven't done a lot of thinking about this either, but, you know, part of what's happening in the divine realm in, again, on the origin of the world is, um, it is this, um, it's kind of a non-gendered or, um, beyond gender binary, um, divinities who tend toward the feminine rather than the masculine again i so want to be careful about um this and realize that you know all of this is a construct mm -hmm. um but i find it so fascinating to think about like oh like um the the god hermaphrodite shows up here um and so there is this there's this fluidity there's this playfulness that's happening and there's a real care about the possibility of um power with rather than power over where um where communities are based on respect rather than violence um this is shown particularly in the relationship between adam and eve in these stories and it's very specifically contrasted with what's going on between eve and the rulers and the rulers and the rest of humanity so whatever is going on these are communities that care about um, different expressions of gender, gender equity, and um, this possibility that people can live together um, across all kinds of differences um, in um, with respect um, for, for and with one another, which they see as an opposition to what's happening in the wider culture. Mm. So much to unpack there. <laughs> Abel's back again. Thank you, Abel. Yeah. Woman's seed in Genesis. Is this a reference or equal to asexual reproduction like in reptiles? Women don't have seed, by the way. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so seed is normally, and again, I don't want you to quote me totally on this. Seed is mostly um, associated with men. Um, in the Greek, it's actually like the word for sperm really and um and woman is just um i'm thinking about the timaeus the cora that accepts the seed and you know birds things so she's kind of the passive um, woman is really the passive receptacle and uh this is turned around in um in these texts as well where um it's one of my favorite scenes where they think that they can um usurp usurp eve's power by um making a making a man that they'll fall that she'll fall in love with so this is why they make adam and they make him out of the ground and they huff and they puff and they can't make him stand up and it's actually the women who give him a soul in this text Ooh. and then um he's on the ground and it seems like he's breathing um but he still can't stand up and so these these um kind of uh androgyne women in the spiritual 
realm on the Send Eve, who's also called life to him. And on the origin of the world actually says, her, um, and her word became a work. So like God's word is efficacious in Genesis, it's actually Eve's wor word that's efficacious in these texts. And um, Adam, and she, she tells Adam to arise and Adam actually stands up and says, you know, I'm going to call you mother of the living because you're the one who's given me life. And that's then a quote again from Genesis. So there's all of these things. Um, so Abel, this is a long way to kind of go about saying this. So there's all of these different interpretations of what's going on. And some of what happens is, um, is these stories also get conflated. So the first story of creation where um, male and female is created in the image of the gods gets conflated with one of the stories that we get from Plato's symposium of the man and the woman being one being and they're kind of rolling around and so that they're not so powerful they get separated and some of them are female female some of them are male female some of them are um are male male and um so then this becomes this idea i think where some of um ideas about asexual reproduction and and some of this other stuff comes from but again it's it's a conflation of um a conflation of these myths and i think we you know people too are wondering this very thing when they look at Genesis and are like, okay, so how did this happen before the fall, before we get kind of into this sexual reproduction? Um, so again, it's a great question. I, again, probably a little outside of my expertise and pay grade, but there are all of these different ways that this is then getting interpreted in um, the mm -hmm. first, second, third, fourth century. Yeah. And I just want to say, I think Abel's referring to like in its original context, and this is a big yeah. difference. When, so what you're yeah. actually engaging in is the reconstruction or the yeah. reinterpretation of these ancient texts, which Jews and Christians and you name it, have been so good at doing, and they can make a book out of a word. I mean, this yeah. is exactly what they did with, uh, with the idea of Abraham's descents. Uh, there was a rabbi, there's a book. I've got it packed up because I've been moving. Um, Cattell Bertolo wrote a book, Jews and Their Roman Rivals. And it's about how pagan Rome influenced Jews, not Christian Rome, but but even before that, how pagan Rome and their adoption ideas and all that. I always mention this, but it's really important, I think, is there's a rabbi arguing in some later Jewish literature, bringing a convert or someone who's trying to become a Jew. And he says, hey, rabbi, can he say the prayer in Deuteronomy 25, the God of our fathers? And he says, no. He could say the prayer, the God of your fathers, but not the God of ours, because Abraham's not his father. And so then another rabbi corrects that rabbi and says, he must not have been reading the scriptures. Because in the scriptures, Abram's name was changed from high father to father of many nations. And the term there, Abraham, the father of many goyim. And he says, he's a goyim. Abraham is his father. So he interpreted Goyim in its original context. It just meant anybody. It could mean an Israelite. It could be anybody. But in the time the rabbi wrote this, they know that that term Goyim is designated for people who are non-Jews, yeah. people who are not Israelites. So this rabbi found a loophole in the language and how it's used contemporaneous to reinterpret the, the Bible. Anyway, I, I just love that example. And, and Derek, I'm so glad that you brought that up. You know, these midrashim that we get, so the midrash that the rabbis are doing, I actually think that these are the very same techniques that the folks who are doing a lot of these Nag Hammadi retellings are using, that they take a text and a counter text, um, but it's like many texts and many counter texts, and they're bringing them together to really um, make contemporary meaning that... Um, that reflects the wider culture. And that's exactly what's happening in the story that you're telling. The difference that ends up happening um, between, in my opinion, mm -hmm. what ends up happening with Jewish interpretation versus Christian interpretation down the line is that the Jews don't really have any problem with having these multiple interpretations existing at the same time. And with Christianity, you get one, they eventually want one meaning and one meaning alone for things. And so the Jews have, you know, in the Talmud and stuff, codified this multiplicity of possible meanings, which is, um, in my, I mean, it's so beautiful and so amazing. And what happens within Christianity is these multiple interpretations end up getting suppressed. There's an interesting thing, like look, just on that point, I feel like the church fathers were attempting to do something like this. Like the way that Augustine would like interpret something in the scriptures mm -hmm. to find 
Christ or something. Mm. He would, oh my gosh, he would bend the biggest arrows if he would bend, bend the biggest bows to get this stuff. Like, uh, I mean, I mean, I don't even know an example because I haven't read it in a while, but I know like he would look at something and go, oh, Noah's Ark is the covenant in which Christ is building to save our souls from the restless, uh, the restless chaos of the world around us. And like, and it's like, it's a boat. Like it's a boat, it's a ship that's on water. And like he made everything out of it. And you kind of go, but I think where they died is that on the creeds and how they took that so serious about Jesus rising from the dead and all of that. When we have so many contemporaneous examples of, there's a book called Coming Back to Life, that permeability, that porous line between life and death. And like, so what? There's mythologies about people who die and come back or in some way in a different status or whatever. And Jesus seems to have an apotheosis type mythological yeah. narrative. And the people who had experiences started to dogmatize that over time rather than, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. anyway, <laughs> we're having fun. We're having fun. Um, Jason Sobeck, Lord of the Four Corners says, why is Peter such a creep to his daughter in AOP? <gasps> oh, uh -oh. Yeah. oh, this story is awful. Um, I actually talk about this in the in the epilogue of my book to basically because it's one of these like a horrible different kind of example but um <laughs> it so in this story peter has a daughter and um she has what they it gets translated as palsy they don't really know what it is but it seems like maybe half of her body is paralyzed and it, paul peter's in some local community and um they're like well, if you're so, if you're so powerful, Peter, why don't you heal your daughter? And so he kind of, this is not going to be exactly how this goes, but he, you know, he snaps his fingers, his fingers and his daughter is healed. And um, she's just absolutely beautiful. And basically he tells the story about how um, her beauty caused so many men to be um, led astray in their <laughs> sexual lust that um that i i don't remember if he actually prays for it or not but she gets this palsy which makes her ugly and so then it saves all these men so basically it's this story where it's like well better for her to be and again i like i i always want to be really careful about this because it's so ableist on certain levels too but this idea that um that 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 it is not it is up to a woman, you know, and it's these same arguments that we get today. Oh, your skirt was too short. Oh, you shouldn't have worn that red lipstick. Right. If you just hadn't done that, you wouldn't have inspired this lust in these men as if men have no control over their own, um, over their own actions and it lets them off the hook. And it's the very same thing in this story with Peter and his daughter. And so then he puts her right back so that she won't inspire any men. Um, to, won't inspire this lust in men. And I just think about all the things too, where, you know, we often talk about how um, women are repressed in these texts, but I also wonder about um, the ways in which men are really um, subscribed to a very particular kind of rule. You have to be empowered. You have no control over your impulses. All of these, all you you have to treat other people this way. You can't listen to others. You can't treat others with this, you know, people who are below you with X amount of kinds of respect. And the ways in which, you know, this this hyper masculinity, the toxic masculinity that we talk about in our contemporary culture really comes from the ways in which men's rules too are very, very circumscribed in these texts. But mm -hmm. because it's yoked with power, we tend not to think about it in these ways. And I do think this is something that then corresponds to the ways in which we think about how um, women are framed, how um, you know all kinds of um, all kinds of folks on every level of the spectrum are framed in the ancient world. That we really need to be looking at this and asking new questions and thinking about the ways both what we you know it ends up having these positive valences you know mm -hmm. around um, power, authority, control. And what if we actually start breaking that down as well and thinking about okay, but how does this actually hem all kinds of people in, including men, when these constructs are put in place? I mean, think about this for a second for those uh, great question by the way jason i really appreciate your question think about this they <laughs> i know it's kind of it, it's sad but it also kind of makes me chuckle in a sense it's like there are guys who've read this literature probably going 
yep, I'm glad he made sure she was turned back into palsy because those poor guys. And it's like they're they're so oblivious to seeing what this did to the female in this situation that they probably read this going, yep, Peter. Well, Peter at least showed his power, but good for him to turning her back so that more men don't stumble. Yeah, That's the kind of like, if that's the perception, I mean, that's beyond, I would say, the toxic masculinity that we're seeing today, but it's connected to this. I just, I would just say there are people who read this stuff probably like that. And, but whew, I'm glad Peter did that. What? Well, what and, the yeah, heck? And, and obviously, so here's another place. And this is just one of the places where sometimes people talk about these extra canonical texts as if they're all good and it's the canon that's all bad. Well, here's an example of an, something that happens in an extra canonical text, which right. is why we need to actually read these things, not assume we know what's there, um, because we get stuff like this that is also part of this conversation that's going on in the second and third century of all of these myriad of voices. And um, what does it, you know, what does it mean for um folks to have different kinds of roles in these early communities. Um, I also think, you know, going back to Tertullian, who um, I talked about earlier with women being the devil's gateway because of Eve, um, and she's the one who actually, you know, she's the reason why Christ gets crucified in his opinion. Um, oh, but wow. he also talks about Lucretia, who's um, one of these women in these early Roman narratives, where she is, um, she's raped by the king's son, and she calls her husband and um, her father asks them each to bring a friend and says, you know, this is what happened. And they basically say, you, um, you know, this wasn't your fault. Um, you can only, um, you know, you didn't sin in the mind. So this doesn't have anything, you know, what happened to your body isn't your fault. And she basically says, um, I don't want anyone, I don't want to be an excuse for anyone's um, unchastity. And she takes the sword, the not, the dagger from one of their boots and kills herself. Mm -hmm. So rather be dead than defiled is, is kind of the message around this. And so, you know, when I think of something like this story, um, in, um, in, you know, in Peter here, that, that, um, you know, there is this vein of things. And this is Tertullian lifts Lucretia up as a good example for Christian women who should be martyred around stuff. And look at her great chastity and da 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 da. And so um again, we get this very wide range of of, of examples um in the ancient world. So we need to read these things and we need to scrutinize them and we need to be asking really good questions around what's happening. Dr. James D. Tabor is in the chat. He says, congrats on getting Celine on, Derek. Kudos. Thank Thanks, you. Dr. Tabor. Yeah, yeah. He uh, loved Dr. I was talking to him earlier on the phone today and just so many ideas floating around. I did want to mention one more thing before we let you go, because I do want everybody to please get your book, is I was reading um, Canada Moss's book on the myth of persecution, and yeah. she brought up an example of pre-Christian examples of – I wouldn't say martyrdom as the same sense as what becomes m monopolized by the Christian church where the redefinition of the term for witness becomes yeah. martyr. Um, but there is a female who is the king's daughter in Troy, and I cannot remember their names, but he calls her as if she's going to get married to him and his wife and lies. She comes. I don't know why I thought about this and everything that you were talking about with the whole woman willing to kill herself. Yeah. I don't know if there's something in this narrative that plays along with this, but she goes and then finally he tells her, listen, I told the gods we'd, we'd sacrifice you for the sake of our city so that we would win the war. And she was so humble in this narrative that it was almost like a Christ like example where she says, you know, when, when everybody's crying, the city's crying. I mean, the, the wife's crying. She's not. And she says, it's okay. I will see this as my marriage. Like, so I wonder what's like, are we reevaluating this text, asking this question about her death being equivalent to her marriage? What is going on? I don't know, but you made me think about that. 
Yeah, I mean, and I think this is part of this longer history of the noble death tradition that we get where, you know, people often talk about Socrates and, and the drinking of the hemlock yeah. and dying on behalf of the people. And that we also get this in, you know, in um, the Maccabees. And, um, you know, what does it mean to die on to die to die on behalf of the people on behalf of the community and that this is considered um, a noble death. And I think you know, I think this is one of the places where we get to ask really complex questions about this, that it's not always either, um, it's not either good or bad. And there are multiple ways in which we can, you know, which we can um, approach some of these questions. Like, what does it mean? You know, and we can think about that in contemporary examples, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, folks who, who die on behalf of the community. And what does this mean? And I think we also need to notice um, again, the ways in which martyr narratives have been picked up in contemporary culture and who are the people who are expected to be martyrs? Who do we expect this from? And who else gets to not be martyred? Who else not, who gets not to have to suffer in this way? And so again, we need to ask more complex questions that it's not a right or wrong, either or, but like, how is this, how might this be viewed as a noble death? And what are the gender implications of this? Why wasn't it a man who was brought in here? Why wasn't it someone else? And what does it mean to really look, look at these complexities um, in the ancient world so that we can look at the ways in which people's lives are wielded today based on these ancient myths? And if we don't think about these complexities in the ancient world, we can't actually begin to, and this is my own shtick on this, but we can't actually um, start to undo um, some of the constructs that are so entrenched in our society today, partially because they're based on things mm -hmm. like Troy and the Odyssey and the Iliad and, and Socrates and Aristotle and Livy and the Bible, on and on and on and on and on that have so affected um, and um, and in some cases infected um, our mm -hmm. culture because we're it's so predicated on on these ancient on these ancient narratives. I have been blown away. I hope that you have as well during this entire show. You are a breath of fresh air and quite insightful on all of this. Seriously, I've learned a lot. I hope everybody will take the time. Go get the book, The Rape of Eve. I highly Thanks. recommend it. Yes. Thanks Absolutely. so much, Derek. And thanks so much, everyone. It was great to be here today. Yeah, get the book. Go check out WestarInstitute.org and join Myth Vision's Patreon. There are hundreds of videos. I'm not exaggerating. I mean that. Hundreds of videos that are not public that are on the Patreon. Help the community grow. Please consider doing so. I'm busting my hump to try and bring you all sorts of material. We've got courses, classes, things like that coming up as well. Um, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you joining me. Thank you. Derek, thanks so much. It was just a total pleasure. Um, and thanks, thanks to all of your viewers and listeners out there. Absolutely. Please don't go anywhere yet. Never forget. Hit that like button, subscribe, join the membership program on YouTube, and never forget, we are Myth Vision.